One thing I would definitely recommend against doing is using those pre-filled saline syringes that the nurses use to flush out their IVs. While they're really convenient, and yeah, the inside IV solution is sterile, uh, even though they're in the pretty clear plastic packaging, the outside of the syringes are almost never sterile and they'll invariably end up on your nice central line sterile field and ruin all the hard work you did to keep everything nice and clean and bacteria free. Next on the list, uh, grab yourself a pair of appropriately sized sterile gloves and if the patient truly is stable you should be getting in the entire sterile garb. Um, all this would include uh, the sterile gown, uh, the face mask, one of those funny looking hats the surgeons are always wearing in the operating rooms. You know, wearing all this stuff, uh, recent studies have shown that uh, it'll reduce the amount of line infections that your patients will get you know, a day or two down the road. Yeah, this stuff's going to make you a little more uncomfortable, make you sweat more, but bottom line is it's better for the patient. So if you have the time, you should do it. While all the kits nowadays do have lidocaine in them, in my opinion, there's never enough lidocaine. Uh, usually there's a glass ampule with 5 cc's of 1% lidocaine, which if you're starting a central line, like especially an IJ or subclavian, in a fully awake patient, uh, I'm usually putting 15 to 20 cc's of 1% lidocaine in them. Uh, for this reason, you want an extra vial of lidocaine at the bedside, uh, just in case you find yourself needing more than is in the kit. Now this extra vial of lidocaine you just asked for won't be sterile because it won't be from the kit. Because of that, uh, when you're eventually sterile and you're ready to draw up the lidocaine, someone unsterile will have to hold the bottle upside down for you while you draw it up into a syringe. The thing about the syringes in the central line kits, they're never really bigger than 5 cc's. Because of that, I'll get a syringe that's at least 10 cc's and open it up into my sterile field before I get started. That way, I'll be able to draw up, you know, the 10 or 15 cc's of lidocaine that I'll need, um, you know, in one shot while someone's holding the bottle upside down for me. So I don't have to keep going back and redrawing more and more into uh, the same syringe every time. Last thing you want to grab is a large tegaderm or opsite. These are one of the transparent IV site dressings. Uh, I'd open that up into my sterile field so when you're all done you could slap that sucker on there and keep everything nice and sterile. So here we have a complete checklist all the stuff you need to gather before starting a central line. You know, if you're just starting your training it wouldn't be a bad idea to keep this list in your lab coat pocket or somewhere pretty convenient. Even after a few years of starting these things on my own, I'll frequently forget something from the list. I wanted to quickly discuss the setup for a central line in less than optimal conditions uh, for a patient that's unstable, otherwise known as a crash line or a dirty central line. Uh, these are central lines that uh, you really won't have the luxury of time to keep everything 100% sterile or have all the supplies ready in front of you before you need to be placing these central lines. A good example of this is if a patient comes in coding and uh, needs IV access, your nurses, paramedics can't get a peripheral line. Uh, this is how to set up for a very quick and dirty central line. So again, the theme here in these central lines is going to be minimalism. Obviously, we'll need a central line kit. When it comes to sterilization of the area, I think the quickest thing to do is to grab a bottle of Betadine, uh, give it a quick squirt on the area that you're going to start the line on. Usually it's going to be the, the femoral groin area for emergent central line. I think sterile gloves for these patients are very much optional. Uh, I've watched uh, interns starting some emergent lines uh, run across the ER, grab a, a set of sterile gloves and try to fit them on their sweaty hands, take some good 60, you know, 90 seconds. I think that's just too long when you should be working to get that line in. So what I'll do instead is take that same bottle of Betadine that I just squirted on the patient's groin and I'll give it a squirt on my unsterile gloves and kind of wash them together and that's it. That's all I do. 
I also think line flush is pretty much highly optional. Uh, so the main reasons for the line flush in the first place are to number one, make sure there's no air in the line before you start, and number two, make sure there's no cracks in the line. And I've never seen a line with a crack in it, uh, so that's number one. Number two, you can take care of the air within the line by, after placing the cordis itself, uh, aspirating back and expelling the air and before you flush anything through the cordis. Alternatively, uh, what I usually end up doing is placing the line, and uh, when you're done removing the end cap from the cordis and letting the blood back up in the line and expel the air before you hook up the IV line. You do have to hook up the IV line quickly to the cordis, so after you let the blood flow back into it, because that blood, if it sits there for a couple seconds, it'll clot your line up. And just to kind of point out the obvious, uh, an emergent line equals no lidocaine think that would be self-explanatory, but I've seen a couple people try to numb up the skin of a coating person before starting a central line. So you open up that kit, that first thing you should be grabbing out of there is that big needle and that big syringe. Again, no lidocaine needed for the emergent line. So here's my very short checklist for an emergent central line. Uh, I really try to avoid placing these unsterile lines as much as possible and take the extra minute or so to grab the uh, all the sterile supplies and to place a drape. Um, but if you do end up putting them in, which is inevitable, uh, take them out as soon as possible and uh, if necessary place a line in a different location under completely sterile conditions. Okay, let's go ahead and start the central line. Uh, but before you go ahead and get sterile and grab that needle, uh, I want you to grab that kit, uh, take it out of the container, place it on a mayo stand, and open it up. Be careful not to touch what's inside, please. Like we discussed before, uh, get your flush and empty it out into either the container itself or a basin, whichever you picked. After you get that flush uh, all ready to go, now it's time to uh, go ahead and prep the patient, clean the patient. Uh, grab whatever you're going to use to clean like we discussed before and clean yourself off a good you know square foot or two area on the patient uh, so you don't have to worry about hitting an unsterile area of the skin. Okay it's finally time to go ahead and get sterile. Just a quick note if you are gowning and gloving uh, to open up your gloves package before you slip the gown on. And it's also probably not a bad idea to have a second set of sterile gloves ready uh, you know, it's inevitable that you're going to touch something unsterile and have to start over. You don't want to be running across the room to go grab yourself another pair of gloves. Here we have my favorite type of drape being placed on the patient. It's my favorite because it's plastic, it's very big, and it's got this sticky thing on it that you peel off and you place directly onto the patient's skin so the drape doesn't move all over the place during your procedure. It's big enough where you could put everything you need right on the field so you don't have to turn around and grab it from the stand. You know, things like your wire, your catheter. As long as the patient isn't moving too much, it's a great idea to place everything right there on your field so it's ready to go. So the next step is to make sure that your triple lumen catheter is ready to be used. So pick it up and run the catheter real quick. Make sure there's no obvious breaks in the line. And then we'll get the ports ready to be flushed. So on each uh, end of the port, uh, you have to remove the tubing lock, which is a sliding plastic piece. Just make sure that it's not clamped down on the tube itself. And there's also end caps that are usually on the end of each tube that you'll have to remove. Uh, after you've done that, uh, take your syringe with IV flush and flush out the ports one by one. Uh, the white and the blue port you're going to flush out with you know, a couple cc's of solution, make sure it runs out the other end of the catheter and when you're done flushing it use that sliding lock to clamp down on the tube, make sure that flush isn't going anywhere. Now the brown port's a little special, it's the port that empties to the distal triple lumen catheter it's also the port where when you thread the wire through the catheter the wire is going to come out the brown port so after you flush it don't clamp it. Keep it open so the wire can go through that port. 